our cry. He hears our call. Woo. Man. Thank God. Thank God. You ever been caught up in the middle of a storm? I remember my grandmother. She would sleep through tornadoes. If there's hurricanes, it didn't matter. She said, I ain't got nothing to worry about. Precious woman. But you know, we all go through storms in life. We all go through trials. We all have decisions to make and paths to choose. And it's the paths that we choose that get us to our destination. Y'all turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts. I've read this and read it and read it and read it. I got one verse wrote down in relationship to it. <laughs> but you know, y'all know of Paul's journey in the shipwreck. But it's the things that led up to that point during those chain of events in this chapter that truly manifest God's power in His people, in His will. We're going to start with verse 1. And it was determined, Acts 27, Acts chapter 27. And it was determined that we, would, that we should sail into Italy. They delivered Paul and certain other prisons, prisoners under one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band, and entered into a ship. I pronounced this thing 500 times, and I had it where it sounded halfway right, so y'all forgive me if I don't pronounce it wrong. Adra, Adramithium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. And that, that word, Adramithium, means the mansion of death. How would you like to get in a boat named the mansion of death? We launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius <coughs> courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. They were, they were rough. They sailed under Cyprus to, to, to be, so they could find a wind to get them where they wanted. And when, they had, and when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycus. And there a certain, there a centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmon. And hardly passing it, came into a place that is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lady and ship, but also of our lives. He said, I perceive that if we go from here on out, there's going to be something happen. Somebody's going to die. We're going to lose all the cargo of the ship because the time is dangerous. The weather's changed. The winds have shifted. It's just not right to leave right now. How many times have we talk, tried to talk to people that are living lascivious lives and doing things that they shouldn't? The path that you're on is going to lead to death. How many times have we tried to talk to people that's got addictions that are doing things that they shouldn't be doing? Adulterers and fornicators, people living in the world, living ungodly lives. How many times have we told them you can't go on like this? That's what Paul said. He said, we can't. You, you, it's going to cost you life. There's going to be damage. Not only with the lives, but the cargo. The people that are around us, if you look at it, 
in a storm of life, the people that are around you that are affected due to the decisions that you make. We don't listen. We don't listen to other people's thoughts or opinions. We always go about what we think. I come to a conclusion a long time ago, you can tell somebody what's right, but 99% of the time they're going to do what they want to do anyway. Because we pride. We're full of pride. We're prideful people. We do what we want to do. We got a right to do what we want to do. And that's the way that people live. But see, Paul was telling them right now, if we leave in this ship, there's going to be damage. And there's going to be loss of life. Verse 11, Acts 27 says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. He believed the master and the owner of the ship more than he believed the man of God. He believed the one that was, they believed the ones that was holding all the money and the possessions over the man of God. And because the haven, verse 12, was not commodious in winter, which means that they couldn't take them over. They didn't have the things, the, the commodities to, to withhold there. The, part, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phineas and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lie toward the southwest and northwest. So they decided that they were going to leave port anyway, despite what Paul had told them, despite the risk that they were going to take. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocliden, which was what we call a nor'easter, or a strong, strong wind. And when the ship, ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, straight sail, so were driven. So basically they, they bound up the ship. They put cables and they wrapped the ship up to try to hold it together because they were stuck in this wind, this temperature storm that's blowing because they wouldn't listen to the man of God that tried to tell them that we don't need to leave. But yet they had better thoughts. How many times have we done that? Well, I know... I know the consequences of what I'm about to do, but I'm willing to take the risk. That's what any big businessman will tell you. If you don't have risk, you don't have rewards. Well, that's the way people go through life. But see, they had warning. They had warning. Verse 18 says, And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. They started throwing stuff overboard. They started getting rid of things. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. They cast out all the furniture, all the lading, all the cargo, all the stuff. Paul told them there's going to be lost. They lost all the cargo, all the possessions, everything that they were hauling in that ship. They started throwing it overboard. Why? Because they were in fear for their life. And we, when neither sun nor stars, verse 20, and many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. You see, it's that way with people a lot of times. You know, we have, we have all our buddies. We've got cars to drive. We've got houses to live in. We've got money in the bank. We've got everything that we need. But when we're not focused on God, when we're headed down the wrong path, when we're getting those ill-gotten gains by being ungodly and doing ungodly things, when we're living in the world and the storm hits, there's nothing to hold on to. All those things that we rely on, we start realizing that they're just what they are. Temple things. When you have nothing to eat, when you have nowhere to go, people lose houses and homes. All this stuff around us. It's happened before in history. Read your history books. You don't have to read the Bible to see that. We're not in control over all that. 
we're not in control. But see, they started casting everything over and they didn't give up all hope. All their hope was taken away that they should be saved. Verse 21 says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me. Oh, Paul, he said, Hey, I'm throwing everything. I told you. I like old Paul. He said, Excuse me, sir, but y'all should have heard me. Y'all should have listened to me before we left. You should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. He said, but now I exhort to you, you to be of good cheer. Be of good cheer, he's saying. And they're still, now you take granted, they're still in the middle of this storm. Paul's saying, I told you we was going to have this loss. But be of good cheer. For there shall not be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. You see, we're riding in a ship right now called Earth. This thing's going to crash. It's headed on a collision course on the rocky ground. God has given us the warning all through His Word. Seek Him. Verse 23 says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. He said, There stood by me an angel of God, and I belong to God. He said, And I serve God. Saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Therefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. He said, I believe, God, that not one soul on this boat shall perish, but the boat and all the goods that are in it will. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, at about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and wished for the day. They threw out the anchors of the ship. Thinking that's a hold us here till the morning. Till the light. But the anchors didn't hold. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out or the fourth ship Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. See, they were trying to get out. The shipmen, they were putting the boat, the lifeboat in the water. They were trying to get out of there. And Paul told them, he said, no. No, because God, he was obeying what God, the angel of God, had told him. Not one soul. He said, if these leave, they will not make it. And you cannot be saved. So then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Boy, I guarantee you at that point right there, there was a lot of fussing going on. We had a lifeboat and we cut the ropes to it. Boy, that just don't make good sense, does it? To people today. We want to flee when trouble arises. We don't want to stand in the midst of adversity because we don't have that boldness like Paul said. Hey, Paul, he wasn't no sissy. He said, excuse me, fellas. I told you this was going to happen. But see, God had put another man there, that centurion. He listened to Paul. He had favor with Paul because Paul had favor with God. And they cut the ropes of the lifeboat. So now we've lost all the cargo. We've lost all, took out all the furniture, all, everything within the boat. And now they done cut the ropes to the dinghy. So they can't get to shore. 
the anchors they laid out, the ship was still being pushed away from land. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried, about, tarried and continued fasting and have taken nothing. He said, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your help, for there shall not an hair from your fall, fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took the bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. That's 276 men in that boat. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. So there went all the food. We've thrown out all the goods. We've cut the boats, ropes on the lifeboat. We've eaten our last meal on this boat. And we've cast our wheat into the sea. Say, And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and ho hoist up the main sail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. They all escaped safe to land. Because God had told Paul that no soul shall be lost. But you see, Paul had a job to do. He had to be watching, did he not? Paul had to be watching everything that was going on on that boat to make sure that God's word was fulfilled. Because even though he told the church, he told the people on that boat, even though we tell the church the warnings, people still trying to get off the boat people still trying to go about their own way and do what they want to do even though it's not in the will of God. You see, they took off on this journey. They had a small south wind that was favorable for them. That's how Satan gets you. He makes things look easy. Well, there, we got the wind that we was looking for. They set sail. But once they got out at, got out to sea, the winds changed. The winds changed. And the whole trip changed. But God was merciful in that he saved all those souls that were aboard that vessel. Now some was able to swim to shore. But those that couldn't swim, God put planks out there for them. He gave them something to float on, did he not? Mm -hmm. But either way, they all made it to shore. And see, even through the process, as we try to warn people through life, we try to tell people, that warn them of their sins is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to tell, we're sinners just the same. We, we are no different. But God has revealed himself to us and in the fact that he has saved us and revealed himself to us, we are to reveal him to others. We've all had problems. I know people that have fought addiction and fought problems with all kinds of sexual pr promiscuity, everything, you name it. It's all sin. And it's our job to warn these people. And same of those same people that we warn, although be it they can't swim to shore, we serve a merciful God. He might send them a plank. He might send them a little old two by four, just enough to keep their head above water. But there's hope for those people. 
There's hope for those people. Hebrews 6 and 19 says, Which hope we have. Where's our hope? It's in Christ. As an anchor to the soul. Jesus Christ is our hope. He's the anchor to our soul. Both sure and steadfast. Which enter into that which was within the veil. Christ is our anchor. He's the anchor to our soul. You see... The men on the boat, they threw out four anchors trying to keep that boat in a steady place till the morning so they could see landfall so they could know what they could do. Then they tried putting the lifeboat in. But see, that ain't the anchors that we need. Paul, he had another anchor. He had an anchor of faith, an anchor of hope. He had an anchor because he knew that God was going to deliver them from that ship. Because God had sent the angel and told him. And just like that ship, we too are vessels. We too are vessels. You know, the vessel in the Hebrew is something prepared. It's an implement. It's a tool. It's a utensil. We're vessels. We're supposed to be vessels of honor. God's a part. He created us in His image. This body is a vessel of the soul. And it's how we navigate our life as to where the soul will be in eternity. You know, Numbers 19 and 15 says that every open vessel, every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. It's unclean. Job talks about hell is open unto God. He sees all the unclean. He sees our sins. He sees our iniquities. Back then, he looked upon the hearts of man and they were evil continually. God sees all the unclean and all the sin in the world. And if we're supposed to be a vessel, where's our covering? Our covering is of Christ. Romans 4 and 7 says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. How are our sins covered? They're covered by the blood. So those that accept Christ, they're covered. They're a vessel of honor. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 4 it tells us that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And see, that's what Paul done. He possessed his vessel in sanctification and honor. And the fact that he wasn't afraid to stand up. Paul was a prisoner. He wasn't the captain of the boat. He wasn't the chief. He wasn't hanging out at the bars with all the, all the shipmen. He was a prisoner on this boat. But yet, he told them, this is going to be a bad trip, fellas. If we don't change, if we don't stay, he said, this is going to be a bad trip. But see, Paul, he possessed his vessel in sanctification and honor. And in doing so, those 276 souls aboard that ship made it to land. And it wasn't over then. Then he got bit by a snake and, you know, nothing happened. And Because he was, a, he, was, he was serving God. He was serving God. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll turn there. Second Timothy chapter 2, 19 through 21 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Paul, what did Paul say? He said, I am God. The angel of God came and spoke to him of whose I am. He said, I am God. He said, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure that this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and of some honor and some to dishonor. Like in that ship, they had all the furniture, all the cargo, 
Everything in that ship, what happened? It got thrown out to sea so that the ship could move on. If any man, just the same as that ship, purge himself from these, purge himself from these, all these fleshly lusts, all these temporal things, all these things that pertain to life but not godliness, things that pertain that are vanity in our lives. He said, If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You see, all the wood that that ship was built out of, all the efforts that they made to hold that ship together, all the possessions, all the things that were the cargo of that ship, even down to the food, it all perished. It all went away. Because when your life is on the line, those things really don't seem to matter anymore. Hebrews 9 and 20 says, Saying this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. He sprinkled all the vessels with his blood. When he died upon the cross, he sprinkled you. He made a covering for you through his blood, through that blood atonement, which is Christ. So you see, we have to look unto God and ask him what his will is in everything that we do. Because God has a purpose for each and every one of us. We are to be vessels of honor. He's called us out, set us apart. Christ has covered us with His covering because if it wasn't for the covering of the blood of Christ, God would look down and all He would see is our wickedness. But instead now He looks down and sees His Son. And we have to listen to His words. And if anything in our life is keeping us from serving Him, if our ships aren't ready to set sail, if we're not ready to do what He's called us to do, we need to ask Him what it is that we need to purge from our lives so that we can serve Him to the fullest. But even though we go through life, we make bad decisions. Sometimes we set sail when we don't want to. We do things because we want it so bad we can't stand it, and God's going to make it all right. And we really don't need nothing at all. We don't deserve anything at all. But it's by His mercy and His love we have the things that we have. He puts the people in our path that He does so that we, as Christians, can help lead them. Don't cut those ropes. Or don't, don't put that boat in the water. If y'all leave, the rest of these folks are going to die. If you fall from grace, if you, if you set a bad example for the church, if you're not living the life of Christ, if you're not living like you're saved, and you're out there showing yourself worldly, and yet you want to be in a church on Sunday, you need to stop. You need to stop. You can throw them anchors out if you want to, but that God, Christ Jesus, He's anchored to the soul. He's anchored to the soul. People lose all hope. When people lose hope, they start thinking. They start wondering if there truly is a God. But see, that's why that Hebrews 6, 19, the hope we have, the hope in Christ Jesus, the hope that the world can't give, the hope that nobody else can give, most people don't have. And see, Paul had that even in the midst of the storm when everything was falling apart around him. He knew that God was going to deliver him because God had told him so. And God has told us the same thing throughout His Word. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, For whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. 
all we have to do is call on His name. All we have to do is believe in His Word. All we have to do is trust and walk according to His Word. And everything's going to be okay. Even in the midst of the storm. Imagine a little girl, what was her name, Miranda. I bet her parents are going through a storm right now. We've all gone through storms. Sometimes we get a little side beside ourselves in the midst when the wind's blowing and the glass is breaking and the house is shaking and the power's out and your kids is out there somewhere and you don't know where they're at. That's, in the, that's a storm there, ain't it? You see, we got to have faith. And we've got to have that hope that God's going to bring them to shore. We've got kids and friends and family that are lost. They're out in the middle of that storm, floating on that piece of wood right now, looking for land, waiting for somebody to come looking for them. Saying, you're the one that God sent me. We have to be that example. We have to start serving God even in the midst of the storm. But we can only truly serve Him and follow His Word once we purged our house from all our iniquities and all our dead works and start truly serving Him. Any questions? Nobody?